Good afternoon, buenas tardes, and thank you for tuning in. On behalf of all of us at the locally based, independently owned bookstore, Books and Books in Miami, Florida, and in partnership with Miami Book Fair, it's my pleasure to welcome you to a virtual afternoon with Leila Slimani to discuss her new novel, In the Country of Others, published by her friends at Penguin Books. Leila Slimani is the best-selling author of The Perfect Nanny, one of the New York Times Book Review's 10 best books of the year, and Adele, for which she won the La Momonia Prize. A journalist and frequent commentator on women's and human rights, she spearheaded a campaign for which she won the Simone de Beauvoir Prize for Women's Freedom to help Moroccan women speak out as self-declared outlaws against their country's unfair and obsolete laws. She is French President Emmanuel Macron's personal representative for the promotion of the French language and culture, and was ranked number two on Vanity Fair France's annual list of the 50 most influential French people in the world. Born in Rabat, Morocco in 1981, she now lives in Paris with her French husband and their two young children. To moderate this afternoon's conversation, we're joined by Diana Abu Jaber. Diana often writes about the intersection of family and cultural identity. Her most recent novel, Silver World, a fantasy with an Arab American girl at its heart was published last spring. Her memoir, Life Without a Recipe was described by Ruth Reichel as bold and luscious. The language of Baklava, her first memoir has been published in many languages and taught around the world. Fencing with the King, a novel of Middle Eastern intrigue and suspense, will be published in 2022 from W.W. W. Norton. Diana teaches at Portland State University and lives in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Throughout this afternoon's broadcast, you're invited to ask questions by using the Ask a Question feature at the bottom of the screen, and you can order your copy of In the Country of Others from Books and Books Below by pressing the green button. We appreciate each and every order and the generous donations from viewers everywhere. And now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guests to the virtual stage. Welcome. Thank you. Well, it's such an honor to be here today talking with Layla. Um, I'm thrilled because I am a huge new fan of her work. And um, I was going to ask if she would read to us today, but she doesn't actually have a copy of this beautiful book. Here's the cover. You need to see it because I love this cover. It's just a gorgeous image. And um, I think maybe even better than having Layla read to us, um, it might actually be more helpful if you would feel comfortable giving us a little summary of the work as you see it. Um, I think that uh, there's a lot of historical background to this that many American uh, readers won't be completely familiar with. So would you mind giving us just a little bit of the, the lay of the land, a little description of the story, Layla? Yes, of course. So the the story of the, the in the country of others is the story of a family, the Belhaj family. And the story begins in 1944 when a young woman, a young woman from Alsace in the northeast of uh, France, meets a man, a Moroccan soldier called Amin. Uh, this soldier is here to liberate the little village where she, she lives and she, she falls in love with him deeply, passionately, and she decides to marry him and to follow him to Morocco. Amin owns a little farm and he wants to become a farmer, a very modern and a wealthy farmer and she decides to share his life but when she arrives in Morocco she discovers that this country is not at all what she had imagined and that her marriage is not at all either what she had imagined and that she will have to adapt to a new culture a new religion a new language a new way of life 
And of course, because she's white and he is an Arab, he is dark skinned, she's also, she will have to face racism and she will feel like an outcast in a society that is deeply influenced by colonialism because French are still um, in, in Morocco at that time. And uh, when the story begins, this is also the rise of the nationalism in Morocco and uh, the people wants more and more to uh, be free from the domination of, uh, of France. So you have at the same time the fight of every individual in the family for more freedom and for more emancipation and the fight of a whole country uh, against the domination of the, of the colonists. Yes, there's so many intersecting uh, tensions in this book and it really um, has this kind of energy that I feel infuses your prose. Your narrative is electric um, and, and it's wonderful it keeps you on your toes as you're reading because there are so many different sides, if you will, so many different identities that are coming together for this couple. Um, I feel like every book, writing a book is its own journey um, and that books start out with ideas and, and often there's some, there's some personal connection, but at the heart of the characters, they start to take on their own life. They start to grow out of that initial, that kernel of an idea and they become their own people. Um, and, and you as an author, you have to have the courage to tell your truth and you have to have faith that your idea is going to grow into something. It's going to become a, a, a work. I wondered, um, would you mind telling us a little bit about your journey in writing this book? What what brought you to it and um, and sustained you through it? Um, in a certain way, I can say that I've always known that I was going to write this book because this book is inspired by the story of my family and especially the couple of my grandparents. And when I was a child, my grandmother, I spent a lot of time with my grandmother and she was a great storyteller. And she told me a lot of anecdotes, a lot of stories about her life, about my grandfather. So she told me those little scenes that, you know, the kind of scenes that you, in, a, in a family you share all the time and you laugh about. And then those scenes, they modify with time and you don't even know if it's true or not true, if it's fiction or, uh, or reality. So I knew that one day I was going to use that because the material was extraordinary. And the life of my grandparents was extraordinary, very different from the grandparents I knew from my other friends or things like that. My grandmother, she was so tall and so exuberant, so free that I, I wanted to write about her. But I remember that uh, a few years ago when I told my publisher that I wanted to write about my family, he said, you are too young. You're too young and you need to have more experience to write about your family. It's going to be your big book, your very important book, your masterpiece. So you have to wait maybe until you are 50 or 60 years old to, <laughs> to write it. So I, I was a little bit frustrated, but at the same time, he's, usually he has good advice from me. So I listened to him. And after uh, the Perfect Nanny and the Goncourt Prize and all that happened after all the, the fact that I traveled a lot, the book had a lot of success. And I was like, what am I going to do? And I was very much afraid of two things. The first thing was to repeat myself, to do something like the, the, like the Perfect Nanny, to do another thriller and to do what people are expecting from me. Yes. And I was afraid also to do something easy. I think mm -hmm. it's very important for an artist or for anyone who is a creator to do things that seems impossible. Mm -hmm. If you're afraid, if you think that you can fail, you will fight and you will do everything you can to succeed in, in what you're trying to do. If you do something easy, I'm pretty sure that it's not going to be good. It's going to be mediocre. So... I began to write about my grandmother because I spent a lot of time in hotels and I was alone and all those scenes were coming back to me, the scenes of my grandmother and the scenes of, that my mother told me also about her childhood. So I, I just wrote those scenes, the scene of the compass where Aisha put in the neck of, of her friend, the scene of the car with the snake. 
And mm. I was laughing with myself. I enjoyed writing that. And so I, I sent those pages, 50 pages to my publisher. And I said, OK, I know what you said. I know about experience and blah, blah, blah. But can you read that and tell me what you think? And he said, it's, it's good. It's very good because it's not only the story of your family. It's already fiction. Yes. It's a novel. You created a, a world. It's not uh, me, Leila, and my family. It's Mathilde and Amin. So uh, I followed his advice and I continued. That's wonderful. And, and we're so glad that you did. Isn't it funny? These people have so much um, advice for their artists and yet <laughs> they don't have to write the book. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad that you went ahead. And I think you're right that the, the easy book is not the interesting book. The, the, the easy project is going, to, is going to fall flat. It's going to be a bit banal. Um, and, and that was one of the things that I was really so taken with in, in reading your book, Layla, was how you engage in this kind of um, world building. Um, you know, they talk about, they use that term world building a lot in science fiction, when you have to imagine a future world. Um, and the same thing I feel like has to happen when you're writing about an earlier time, a, a time set before your own life. Um, and you have to do the same thing. You have to evoke that place and those feelings and and the detail. And it's it's all here in your novel. I mean, I, I was reading this and I felt like, yes, I am, I am on their farm right now. And, and I know what these people look like. And, and this is what it, 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 it is to, to be in Morocco in the forties and to be a French woman and to be completely unmoored. It was, um, it was so believable. And, and so I, I, I want to ask you, um, not only as a reader, but as a writer, um, will you share with us how you went about doing your research? How, how, did, how did you make all that wonderful, lush detail happen? First of all, I, I read, I did things that are very classic. I, I read a lot of books, historical books. I um, went to the library to find archives, to find uh, old movies, pictures, wow. and also diaries, letters that were sent from Morocco to France by very simple, very modest people just sending the day-to-day -day life. I, mm -hmm. I went to this place. I went to this restaurant. Of course, also, I interviewed a lot of people. I uh, tried to remember what my grandmother told me, but I interviewed my mother, my uncle, and other people from my family. But at the end, I have to say that there is something magical. I don't know how it happens, but all those information that you have, they mix in your head. And at the end, you have kind of a vision. It's like a movie in front of your eyes. Um, I think that when you write a historical novel, you should not be afraid of, um, at the end, feeling free to imagine and to use your imagination. I, I think what is very difficult when you write a historical movie is that you're a little bit afraid of your own imagination because you think, mm -hmm. oh, maybe it's not like this, maybe it was not like that. But the truth is that a lot of things change, of course, the the kind of car we use, the, um, the, the way we build houses, the way we dress. But a lot of things remain the same also. Yes. The, yeah. the, the way we love, the way we care about others, the way we look at flowers, the, the sunrise, the sunset. So you have to, to use that also, to use your own experience, your own emotion. And I think what is so strong and so beautiful with literature is that you can le read Anna Karenin today and you understand exactly what happens. You understand yeah. what she feels. You understand the the way uh, she looks at the world. So, I think it's very important to try to find this uh, yes, this equilibrium, this mix between the past and all you have to to put from uh, as details to evoke an, another time. But at the same time, use also your modernity and your experience to give some yeah some strength to the to the text. Yes, yes, uh, it's true. The the themes that you're dealing with here, uh, in many ways, are timeless. Um, a lot of the same issues that follow us into our contemporary lives, um, 
the the book takes on big canvas, um, big screen kinds of 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 themes, you know, of, of cultural difference and and transgression and, and and sexual freedom. These are all very very much alive today, just in different, slightly different form, slightly different um, clothing, if you will. Um, and and I love the ideas that permeate this narrative. I feel like Matilda especially has, um, she has these insights that are so striking. You know, there's a moment where when she returns from Alsace and she comes back to Morocco and she's looking at her life and she's thinking about the idea that freedom is not necessarily a positive thing that freedom creates doubt um, and that choices, I think she, as you put it, gnaw away at one. That's such an interesting idea that there's something almost dangerous, potentially difficult about, about that. Um, her idea that children um, can be a form of redemption. They can also be a kind of vengeance on, on the past, on others. Um, these are, are wonderful and remarkable ideas that fill the narrative. And, and then at one point she's looking around at her life and she's thinking that everything that she has done is doomed to disappear. That's it. Basically she sees that She's created a life, but it doesn't have a kind of permanence to it, at least in contrast with what she sees happening with her husband's life, with Amin and, and the farm that he's built by himself, hand by hand. Um, and I, I just, I love that. I think it's so moving. There's such truth to that idea. Um, do you feel like is it harder to write about a woman's life in the sense of the domestic life, the domestic story? Because Matilda is living a domestic story in a certain respect. It's a, a huge story and yet it's a, a private story and a quiet story. Um, are women's stories less valued um, is the domestic story inherently less recognized? What do you think about that? Absolutely. I think they are less valued. And I think that all my work is about that. Mm. I'm absolutely passionate with the idea that I will write all my life trying to explore what happened behind the closed doors. And I'm completely and absolutely convinced that um, when you write about domestic life, you write about politics. It's very political because the first, the origin of violence is in the house. The origin of domination is in the house. Domination and violence towards children, towards women, towards uh, domestic. I think that everything begins in the house. And what is very interesting is that there is still a kind of omerta of silence about what's happening behind the door. You you have the right in a certain way to denounce what's happening in the public spaces, but not to denounce your father or yeah. your husband or your son. You have to be accomplice to that and you have to be strong and to accept what's happened in the house. And uh, as, a, as a wife, enfin, as a woman, uh, the first role you are conditioned to are in the house, to be a good daughter and to to be a nice wife and a good mother, of course. And I think of that course. the beginning, of course, of the guilt for women begins there. Mm -hmm. And with this idea also that outside is dangerous and a woman shouldn't spend too much time outside because outside there are predators. And so you should stay home because at home people need you and you, you can sacrifice for them, but they will give it back to you. And there is also this idea that the life of women, contrary to the life 
life of man is not a life where you build things that will stay forever. You, you're not supposed to write books, to build houses, to do big things that are going to mark generation and generation of people. You cook and people eat. And at the end of the day, you have to cook again and to cook again and to cook again. And that's something that always fascinated me in a, in a bad way. I was... I, I always thinking of those generation and generation of women for centuries who spent so much time in the kitchen cooking and cooking and, and at the end nothing remains from that it's like the myth of of Sisyphe you climb the mountain and at the end you have to go back and climb the mountain again and I think it's uh, that's also why I admire women so much because they could have been so bitter because of that because of not being valued and not being considered as heroes like men and yes we build things but secretly silently we do things people believe that we do it out of love because we are supposed to be so nice and so sweet we don't do it out of love we do it out of strength and because we want to survive and because we want our children to survive and so that's the story i want to tell that there is something very important happening in the kitchen and that cooking every day, it's not nothing. It's raising children. It's um, fighting a war. It's doing a lot of things. So, yeah, I really believe in the idea that literature can focus completely on domestic life and be interesting. That's wonderful. And and that's, thank you for that that answer. And it's incredibly rich and and nuanced. Um, you. What I see happening in the book is an intersection between racial and political and gender lines. And in many ways, I feel like one of the things that is so striking about Matilda is that she inhabits this, what, what is called liminal space you know, the, the space in between identities, in between things. Um, uh, for, for the people who haven't read the book yet, you're, uh, you're realizing that um, these, these, these characters, they're in the throes of a nationalistic reckoning. Um, and there is an attempt in, in certain respects to divide the country between us and them. Uh, Arab and French, um, the insider and the outsider. Uh, but Matilda, her very existence in this time and this place, it, it kind of interferes with all of that. And certainly that of her children does. Um, and her, her daughter Aisha in particular, she is mixed race. She's French and Arab. Um, and one of the markers is her frizzled blonde hair, which sits on her head like a pile of hay. That's such a great description. Um, and I wondered, could you say more about this bridging, Leila, this kind of, this intersection? Do you see it as a form of loss? Do you see it as something, as, as there being something to be gained here? Um, do you feel this kind of tension within yourself if it's not asking too much? Um, uh, I, you know, as a child of, of a mixed race background and heritage, I really identified with it. When I was reading it, I thought, yes, 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 this is what it feels like to be something of both and not entirely of either. So would you speak to that? Yes, I think that's why also I wanted to write this book because of all the question I had in my life about my identity. Uh, who are you? Where are you from? Uh, so when you say you're French, they say, yeah, okay, but where are you from? Because you, I, I see you, I can see you're not a, a good French or real French. When you say in Morocco, you're a Moroccan, yeah, you're Moroccan, but you're too francophone, true, open to all the Western ideas, so you're not a real Moroccan. And you have the feeling all the time that uh, you're a kind of, uh, you're deceiving people on your identity. Yes. You, you're never pure, you're never the good French or the good Moroccan. And uh, I was born in a very mixed and multicultural family when we were 
for instance, at Christmas uh, at the table, you had my grandmother who was a Catholic, my grandfather who was a Muslim, my uncle who was a Jew, my other uncle who is a communist who hates God. So it was always about fight and all that. And for me, it was just uh, normality. It was very banal. And when I grew up, I understood that it was not that... Uh, that easy and um, I was feeling very frustrated because when you're a teenager you want to belong you want to know who you are I wanted to be part of a crew of a group uh, I wanted to have tradition and things to be very clear black or white good or bad and uh, I couldn't understand my parents who said to me no it's complex and you have to try to invent yourself and understand what is your own identity and so I interviewed my mother and I asked a lot of questions to my mother about that and um, she told me about all the racism she had to mm -hmm. uh, to endure when she was a child and I have to say that when I began my research the thing that surprised me and fascinated me the most was the the map that I found of McNess in 1952 and I understood that this map was the metaphor and the, the expression of all that you had the, the city was divided very clearly between the European city and the Arab Medina. And mm -hmm. it was impossible to cross this frontier, this boundary mm -hmm. uh, at, at the end of the uh, after six, I think. So my grandfather, he could go in the European city, but uh, when the, the day end, he has to go back to the Arab city. And I understood that uh, for a very long time, for the generation of my parents and my grandparents, the idea of mixity, of multiculturality, was something not only impossible, but something bad, something wrong. Uh, the idea that you could live with someone who doesn't share your tradition, your culture, your religion, everyone would tell you it won't work don't try to do it if we want to live happy we have to live separately everyone in his in his group and um i think that's why it's it is still difficult today to be two things people think that when you are mixed race you you are lucky because you are two things and i try to explain to them that sometimes you feel you are nothing yes. not uh, not uh, arab and not uh, and not french you have to find your own definition and it's never easy because uh, as you know, human beings are lazy and they like to to be told what they are. And it's easier when people told you you are this or you are that. But when you have to invent yourself, I think it's more difficult, but more interesting. But more interesting. Thank you. Yes, right? It's <laughs> Instead of just being the simple this, that, you know, to be a whole new creation is a wonderful thing. Um, I love that. Thank you. <laughs> and and it does seem like that is that is the direction of the world, isn't it? You know that human humanity is fluid. We are multivalenced. We are complex beings and the movement is toward complexity, not toward stagnation. Um, stagnation doesn't tend to work that well in the long view. Um, uh, but I do wonder, um, I, someone was asking me just the other day, you know, about your novel. We were talking about the, the, this divide and the idea of political tension. And, and this friend said, well, is this book political? And, and I said, well, it, yes and no, um, because I tend to associate that word political with the word polemical. Um, and, and, and I feel like your book, your characters, you show such deep compassion for them. They're, they're all of them. I, I don't feel like there are any real villains in the book, if you will, um, that if you scratch the surface, you can understand the deeper motivation um, even behind those characters that you may not agree with at all or want to be close to, you, you can understand them. And, and that makes polemic very difficult. Um, there's no outside when that happens. We're all, we're all humans on this page. And I, I thought about an interview I read with a Palestinian writer 
who was talking about um, the feeling that all Palestinian artists have to write about Palestine, that in a way they feel imprisoned by this political issue, if you will, that you always have to be talking in some way about the occupation, the brutality of their experience, that that it's it's a kind of artistic prison of the mind, if you will. And I wondered if, if you might talk about, do you feel like writers have a responsibility toward our collective understanding of, of truth? Do, do, is there something that writers owe to their readers? What would you say to that? No, I think that writers are completely free. They can do whatever they want. That's why we decide one day to do literature and to spend 12 hours per day behind the desk. It's not because we feel a responsibility towards other people, but because um, we feel completely free and we want to find a true language, a way to express ourselves and to tell things to people. That is not the way we speak in real life with with the social mask and appearances and where we have to be polite and to say things that people want to hear. I think that we want to find another language, another truth. And it's important not to forget the language. We work with that. That's our first material. So we want to create beauty. We want to create um, emotions. But I think we have a responsibility, but it's not a responsibility to the readers. It's a responsibility to our art to literature itself we have to be as sincere as we can we have to be we have to be in a sort what georges bataille the french philosopher he said that uh, the writers have a hyper responsibility that is when you have this tool so powerful that is language that it's truth you have to do the best you can with it so you can Talk, you can talk about whatever you want. If you're a Palestinian and you want just to write uh, love uh, poems, you have the right to do so. You can be a, a Afghan woman and you want to write sonnets about nature. You have, of course, the right to do so. The only thing that matters is that you do it as sincerely and as strongly as uh, as you can. That's the only responsibility we have. But we are totally free, and no one can tell us what to do. Oh, I love that. I love that. That. Yes, um, and and that's such a great way to to frame this kind of a question to talk about the the substantive experience we bring to our art as people as as human beings rather than as political figures. Um, it, it, and you know, I don't, I'm not, I don't want to change the subject, but I do want to just take that idea and turn it a little bit and ask about motherhood, um, if you would. Um, I feel like there is this question that accompanies the question of the political, um, the institution of marriage, the idea of the collusion between men and women, and how marriage can itself seem like another country. Um, if this question is too personal, we can set it aside, but okay. Um, what is your feeling about the country of marriage? Um, because it's, it's a big issue in the book. And, and I, I would love to know your feelings on this, both as, as the author of this book, but as an author as well. Um, how, how do you see marriage working, particularly for women? I think, like Virginia Woolf, that uh, for women, marriage is like putting an eagle in the cage of a canary. It's, um, it's <laughs> terrible at the beginning if you have to accept all that marriage, marriage exige, I don't know, uh, away from you. It's absolutely terrible. It's a lot of frustration, a lot of, uh, uh, of violence. But it's also because we feel so guilty and we want to uh, act in a certain role as perfect mothers, as perfect wife, because we are supposed to be nice and to be uh, generous and not to be selfish. Um, I think that marriage can be something 
absolutely wonderful when there is a true equality. And this equality doesn't come only from the man or the way the, your husband looks at you, but the way you look at yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember that when I began to work, um, how guilty I felt because of my children, because of my husband, then I was traveling a lot. And a lot of people were telling me, oh, you're traveling a lot and your poor children, they must miss you. And my husband who was traveling a lot, people would tell him, oh, you must miss your children. So he uh, yeah. was the one who was suffering and I was the bad mother who was leaving yes. her children. <laughs> and at the when I heard that, I was like, okay, now, I decide never to feel guilty again. And what my husband does, I will do it. So I come back home sometime and I and I sit in front of the television and I ask my husband, what do we eat tonight? And give me a beer. Uh, very often I say, okay, I don't want to go with the children to the park. I don't want to do this or that. I don't want to cook. I don't want to go to the supermarket. And he's doing it because he loves me and because he, he understands that there is no reason for me to do more than him when it comes to the house, to the children. So I think it's very important for women to stop feeling guilty for all those things and to think always that you have to do this because you're the woman, you're the wife, so that's you, you is supposed to do the grocery. And um, really it comes from, I think, from from you, it has to come from you to decide that it will not be a prison, it will not destroy my individuality. I have also the right to claim that sometimes I don't want to be with you. Sometimes I need to be just with my friend and uh, to be another person someone maybe you won't even like or do you don't want to see but i have the right also to uh, uh, secret places or to a uh, secret personalities i don't want to be a mother all the time either so i think really it has to come from ourselves yes 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 uh, there's there's a great great scene in the novel where when matilda returns to her home when i mean alsace um and she actually considers not coming back. You know, she's able to think about her children and her life back in Morocco. And, and she is able to imagine a whole other life to her, for herself. Um, in fact, she believes she has to have it in order to survive. Um, and I felt like that was such a powerful scene in the book. Um, and so much uncertainty as to what she will do, and I won't give it away, but um, it is it is an extraordinary scene because there's no there's really no guilt there. There's really there there's very little in the way of um, a questioning or or a guilty conscience or anything like that. This is a, almost strictly a matter of imagination and possibility. Um, and, and, you know, I feel like what happens in the novel is that she doesn't, she doesn't find that there's a perfect place for her anywhere in terms of gender. Um, in, in France, her life almost feels uh, trivial or ephemeral, you know, there's, there's a, a lightness to it. In, in Morocco, she's, she becomes a, a kind of healer. She has a substance and respect, um, but by the same token, she's also dominated by a patriarchal culture there. Um, so for, for Matilda, for so many women, this, this is a reality that it just shreds national and uh, political issues, and it goes right to the heart of, of what makes us who we are. Um, I, I love no, that. I completely, I completely agree with you. And, you know, for a very long time, people, you know, sometimes people look at me with a sort of a condescendance asking me, oh, it must be so difficult to be a, a Moroccan woman. You suffer so much there. And I'm like, you know, maybe two streets um, close to your house, a woman is suffering a lot also because patriarchy is very universal. Of course, here in Morocco, the laws are terrible and the way women used to live was terrible, but it's very important to show that at that time, a woman would feel trapped. The idea of freedom for a woman was scandalous. The mm. idea that you could live 
for yourself and not to ask uh, to anyone what to do and not to obey to anyone was something very subversive. And a lot of women, even if they wanted to do so, they wouldn't dare to because the at that time, being a free woman was also to be marginalized, to be judged, to be a paria. And um, today I can see that in Morocco and it's something that moves me a lot. I have a lot of friends who are free women but I can't say that they are happy women mm. because they are very lonely. They are for majority of them marginalized. And when I ask them, would you do the same? Would you redo the same? Would you make the same choice? Very often they say no. Uh. And I think it's very sad, the idea that you can have regret, that you can regret your own freedom. That's something terrible. And uh, for centuries, women had to choose between freedom and being completely marginalized and so uh, Mathilde she chose to belong she chose to be a, a wife a bourgeois to have a family because she's too afraid of what could happen if she abandons everything yes 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 there there's no perfect solution um not in the book not in life there there are alternate narratives um and and the the journey, the the search for that solution is always in front of us. It, it makes me think about when I was in graduate school, um, I, my instructors told me that I could choose between being a writer and being a mother, but that I couldn't do both. <laughs> and um, yeah, and I don't think they were saying that to the men. Um, this was something reserved especially for the women to, to for consider, sure. <laughs> right? Um, and and I do think that, you know, well, that's, I guess, the, the question of, of motherhood is in, in addition to marriage. It, it is that, that other country. Um, have you found that motherhood has, you know, has it complicated your writing life? Has it, has it, has it been an obstacle? Has it been an inspiration? Both, both. Uh, it it has complicated my life in in practical terms. The fact that you want to be alone and that you can't be alone, and that uh, it's very difficult to explain to a child that you need silence and that you need to be uh, to to lock the to close the door and to lock the door and that he he can't disturb you. Uh, and you you feel selfish because it's not the same as to say okay I have to go to the office I have to go to work and you go out of the house and you have your life, but your child is just next to you, and as I was saying before, you have to fight against your own feeling of guilt and to say okay I'm here but I won't spend that time playing Lego or, or cooking for my child I will spend that time writing my book, so yes it's difficult to. In, practical terms but at the same time it gave me so much inspiration just yes. becoming a mother uh, all the feeling that comes with motherhood looking at my and observing my mother friends uh, observing my own children I'm fascinated by children I think that they are the most fascinating characters so just look at them and hear the way they use language uh, the way they look at the world the way they share an emotion and they express an emotion so yeah it was a yeah, great source of uh, inspiration. That's that's wonderful. I I found the uh, children in your in your novel very exciting. I loved the sections with Aisha and Salim. I thought they were just marvelous characters, and they they light up the page. Um, there's something very special about their sections, and I'm hoping you're going to go on and write more of their their lives. I see that this is volume one. Um, yes. Would you care to share a little bit about your upcoming volumes? Yeah, the next volume that I'm fi finishing right now will be in the um, 60s, the end 60s, and especially summer 68 and 69. Mm -hmm. So during the hippie movement in, in Morocco, it was a very brief moment, but very interesting. Huh. Uh, so it's going to be a lot about uh, sex, drugs, rock and roll, music, and uh, all that. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> oh, that's so exciting. Uh, and when will that be out? Uh, I think in France in February 2022. Okay. All right. 
All right. Oh, great. So we have something to look forward to. Um, I could keep going with you, but I know you have some questions that the audience would like to ask. Um, Christina? There are, there are a few here. So let's see. Um, Amin would shut himself away in silence and brood over his cowardice, his betrayal of his people. Why does he feel like a coward? Oh, I think that Amin feels like a coward for two reasons. The first one is that he's not involved with the nationalists and with the fight for independence. And he feels that he had fought for France and that in a certain way he's betraying his country and he's acting like a coward, not going into the street to fight for the independence of Morocco. And probably he feels like a coward because he's uh, threatening his own wife and his child and his sister. And he's a man with a gun in front of two or three people who are disarmed. And he feels like a coward to, to be like that, but um, he can't help himself. Okay, here is another one. Why do you think Mathilde, and by extension your grandmother, put up with such crap? <laughs> Um, I think that's a question that you could ask about so many people in the world, not uh, only Mathilde, but um, if you ask, you can ask this question about a lot of women who are beaten, who are uh, raped every day by their husband, and uh, asking the question like that is a, a way also of uh, putting some guilt on them, like, oh, she's not brave enough, she's not strong enough, why isn't she living? And I think that uh, the majority of women who accept that are not uh, coward or are not weak, it's just that they have other priorities or other things that maintain them in this situation, their children or the lack of money or the lack of independence. So, you know, as a writer and also as a person, I try never to judge people just to understand them. That's my work is to understand my characters. So I think that she stays because like many women at that time, she thinks that she has no choice, that she made a commitment to a man, to a country, to her children, and that she has to do the best with what she has. And even though her husband is violent and uh, sometimes uh, unfair and dark, at the same time, she knows that uh, he can be a good man, that he's a good worker, that uh, he's a good father, that uh, so he has also beautiful sides. So I think it's never black or white, it's very complex and very gray. And um, you know, for many people who stays in a marriage, then you look back and you say, why did I stay? But in the present, you, you never know, you try your best and uh, it's always difficult. You seem to be very comfortable living in this um, in between, like being able to, it's just really interesting, like your understanding of so many different things at the same time and and maybe like a certain comfort in in being in that place that is not one thing or another it's really interesting to hear you speak it's been an amazing conversation so someone would like to know would you tell us about your experience leaving journalism to write fiction what was that transition like mm. You know, when I think about it, I think that I was completely crazy and completely unconscious of doing what I did. Because one day I entered in the, 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 the office of my, my boss and I said, you know what, I'm quitting the job and I'm going to be a writer. And he laughed at me. And my son was one. So he said to me, oh, that's good. So you're going to stay home and take care of your son. And I was like, no, I just told you that I'm going to write a book. Oh, so that's good. You're going to enjoy being a mother. And he wouldn't hear me he, he, and he wouldn't believe me. And I was so angry that I was like, OK, in one year, I will show him that I'm a writer and I can do it. But when I think about it, I'm not sure I would be today that I would have this kind of unconsciousness or bravery to do that. But sometimes you don't know why you sort of intuition and instinct pushes you to do something and to do to, to make the, the good decision. Great, thank you. Um, so here's a question from me. Um, is there such a thing as a female text? No, there's a good text or a bad text. <laughs> there's good literature and bad literature. And I think that female writer can be extraordinary writers or bad writers. I think that it doesn't exist, but I think that what exists is a 
female way of looking at the world, of course, because uh, socially, politically, historically, we do not share the same position in the world as men. And uh, as I was saying before, for instance, in terms of uh, domestic life, I think that it would be uh, more, maybe more difficult for a man to imagine what it is to spend your whole life in a kitchen. But even so, I think that a, a, a man can write about this. And I would never say you don't have the right to write about this because you're not a woman. I can write about a man and a man can write about a woman. Literature is uh, something so extraordinary. Imagination is such a great power that we have as human beings. It's what makes is it possible for us to understand us. You know, as a Moroccan uh, woman, I can, by reading a book, understand a young boy in Peru. I can understand an old woman in China. And I can feel exactly the same emotion as her. And um, I think that's why I, I am a reader and why I'm a writer and why I, I'm so passionate about literature. Because at the end of the day, what you what you discover is that we are all the same. Maybe we don't speak the same language, we don't have the same religion, but when Anna Karenin dies in the in the railway station, we all cry because we understand her and we understand what is love and what is despair. So yeah, that's what's wonderful. Okay, let's take one more. Um, at what age did you decide that you wanted to become a writer? At five. Mm. at five and uh, I was absolutely sure of what I, I was going to do. I wanted to be a writer slash lawyer and I wanted to defend <laughs> everyone and so my mother said that we were having dinner. She said, okay, so Leila is going to be a writer. I was like, okay, great. I like this idea. I want to be a writer. And so my parents they always told me that I was going to be a writer and uh, I believed them. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> So this has been just a delightful conversation. Wait. Thank you so much. There's another question coming in. Hang on, let me see what, what they're asking. Um, what writers would you recommend for those who enjoy your work? Um, you know, maybe it's strange, but I was very much influenced by American writers when I wrote this book. I did not read at all Moroccan, Algerian writers. I didn't want to be in something too folkloric or, you know, exotic. So when I, I when I wrote in the country of others, I read Faulkner a lot and Flannery O'Connor and mm -hmm. Carson Michaelers, William Styron, all this literature from the South, mm -hmm. because I think that what is very interesting in terms of tension between races, between genders, in the description also of nature that can be at the same time hostile and beautiful. So it's always interesting to find your inspiration far away and because then you will look at things that are very familiar to you in a in a different way. Uh, what I could recommend also is a Brazilian writer, two Brazilian writers that I love, who are Jorge Amado and oh. Clarice Lispector. It's oh, yeah. really beautiful and very poetic, and um, I'm reading them right now, and I think it's um, it's amazing. Mm. Thank yeah. you. We love book recommendations. <laughs> you can get them all at Books and Books, folks. So anyone who's watching, um, thank you for your work. Thank you for In the Country of Others, for bringing it to us today, for being in our virtual bookstore with us. Thank you, Diana, for wonderful moderating. It truly was just a sensational conversation. I've written down so many notes from it, um, just so much food for thought. And I'll just remind everyone watching everywhere that you, if you don't already have the book, you can order it from Books and Books below. You can come into any of our stores. Thank you. Come Thank into you so any much. of our stores and get it there. And and thank you so much for watching. Thank you for being with Thanks. us. Yeah. Take good care. Bye. Thank you. Bye.